Hey everyone, Wayne Fox here. I just got a package from Acasis. This is the new TB501 Pro. Now I've reviewed the TB501. The 501 Pro is a little more expensive, but it's probably a better choice. So let me get this unboxed and then we'll talk about its features compared to the 501 and other devices and some comparisons, do some quick speed tests. I think we'll probably get identical results to the 501. So what makes this one maybe worth a little bit more money? Well, let's check it out. First of all, I did get two packages, and I neglected to mention this with the first video, or the first one I bought also comes with this. So they give you a very nice, uh, pretty well-made carrying case. And this one here is black. The original one that comes with a 501 is blue, but they're both uh, really nice. And they're included, as you can see, it's got a little for the SSD and for your cable here. So it's a little extra that you don't get with most of the others. I've heard the tree bleat had a case for some people, but mine didn't come with one. One thing I will mention is this one came much faster than the first one. It looks like what they're doing is they're using UPS to manage their stock. So this is actually being stocked in Canada by UPS and then fulfilled by UPS for them. Now, eventually, I assume you're going to be able to buy it from Amazon. But in the meantime, this only took me, I think, four days or five days. Uh, I'll check out for sure from when I ordered it till when I got it. Anyway, let's just see what's in the box here. As is usual with the cases, boxing is well done. Again, notice this is an 80 gigabit per second SSD enclosure. This is the 501 Pro versus the 501, which I reviewed earlier. Um, I think I paid the same amount of money for it because I was able to get a, they have a 20% discount coupon that I was able to grab. Uh, if you want to buy one, but you want to save some money, just check their website and get on the email list and you'll get a discount eventually. Thought I'd interrupt real quick as I was finishing the video, I see that right now they have a spring sale going on. And if you buy this device, you'll see that with this code, you can get a 20% discount and you also get the black case. The black case is part of their spring sale. I don't know if the black case comes all the time or if it's just a special. I didn't buy the other one on a special. I paid the regular price and I still got that little blue case. But anyway, right now, this is the end of March, 2025. They seem to have specials going quite often. So if you want one of these devices, you can save quite a bit of money by watching for one of the specials. Okay, back to the video. And the first thing I'm gonna notice is this is more similar to the 401. All right, this is the 401, which is Thunderbolt 4, uh, almost the same size, it's really close. Again, it has a power button on it like the 401. This is the 501, the regular 501, and as you can see, it's it's a little wider and a little shorter. Overall volume is about the same. Both of them are toolless. If we want to open this one, you just pop it open right there. It uses a little ball bearing system. Now this is different because now it's used a clip on one side to lock it in right here. And the ball bearings just hold this end in. Just finish up what's in the box real quick. And again, it comes with a Thunderbolt 5 cable. A couple of silicone, uh, I don't know, grommets, whatever you call them. Again, it's got a one mil and a one half mil heat pad, which probably aren't thick enough, as I've mentioned in my previous videos. And it looks like in this case, they've gone back to the build where instead of different holes in it, 
if you have an SSG that's shorter, you'll notice that this little, these little parts um, basically allow you to extend it to fit shorter of this, other than the standard 2280, I think it's called. So real quick, let's just kind of compare the two. Obviously, one of the differences is the size. I don't think it makes much difference. Uh, this one is also, I don't know if you can see this, but it's quite a bit thinner. Um, but a couple of things, if you'll notice along here, we have some small little holes. And those little holes actually feed from both sides. Those little holes actually feed into the compartment that has the SSD in it. Whereas on this one, I don't really see a good way for air to get into where the SSD is because the um, these lines, if you look on the inside, they really don't show where I can actually see those holes in this one. So I think we get a little better air circulation around the SSD with this one. Now, might not make any difference the way that it works. It's pulling air in from these holes and out through. And it could be that these are just so large that just not much can get pulled out of those little ones with all of this stuff that's in the way. Two big advantages to this one. One is the switch. The switch will turn the fan on. By default, it appears when you first plug it in, the fan is off. Now with the 401, the fan is on or off, and I believe it's on unless you turn it off. This one, the fan is off when you plug it in, and you have to actually hold the button down and then turn it on. So you can accidentally turn it off or on, and it defaults to off. Okay, just a quick interruption. After I played with this device, the video's almost done. I realized a little feature about the fan, not documented. And that is the fact that the fan is actually thermally controlled. It will turn itself on as needed and off as needed. So you don't really have to worry about it. You can force it to be on if you feel like you really wanna make sure you've got some heat issues you're concerned about. Most people don't realize these SSDs do get really hot and they're gonna feel hot. They're gonna run in the 130 to 135 degree range. Some of them are cooler, but the real good ones usually run pretty hot. But you can force the fan to be on by holding it down for a couple seconds when it's off. And if you want some comfort, if you feel that's good, you can do it. But the thermal control feature is not mentioned in the book and probably pretty useful. Well, back to the video now. Now, the only other feature this has, and we'll test this in a minute, I've noticed that this one you can't is not USB 3.2 uh, compatible, 10 gigabit per second compatible, and this one is. So I can plug this into a USB uh, 3 port, and I can actually get about eight or 900 gigabytes a second if that's what my computer has, or if that's all I happen to need at the time and I have a spare port. So that's the other feature that this one adds. So I'm going to assume I'm going to need a thicker thermal pad. You can see with the one out of this, there's a fairly nice indentation. You see there's a fairly nice indentation of the controller chip. Very easy, about a 30 degree angle right here. So you can see about a 30 degree angle. Hold it up like this. Find the little groove in the grommet. I think I've shown that before. You see there's a little groove there. Groove goes into the groove in the that and push it in and it should snap down into place. Okay, the, again, the instruction book does not mention using a thermal pad and the two they give you are definitely too thin. You get a half mil and a one mil and even that one mil is too thin. Some people say you can stack them and I suppose it's possible. There's a chance you'll get an air pocket in those and that air pocket will be an insulator rather than conduct heat. Personally, I think it's better just to go ahead and, and buy and invest in one that's the correct thickness. They're just not that expensive. I thought what I would do is go ahead and put that original pad in and do some testing to see what results we get, just to show you that it probably isn't thick enough. I hear people all the time complaining about their SSDs getting too hot. And my guess is it might be because the manufacturer's thermal pad just isn't the adequate thickness with some of the new modern SSDs, which are thinner than they used to be. Anyway, what I'm gonna do is run this uh, test and just see how hot we get. Here we go. 
You can see the outside of the case is only about 97 degrees. Well, now we're gonna go ahead and run the test. And this is a little bit further into the test. You'll see that we're up to over 190 degrees. The case is still only 102. So we're not able to transfer heat off of that SSD at all. It's getting way too hot, well above spec. I think with almost all of these devices, you might need to add a thermal pad. If you don't, you might be getting too hot. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and cut a custom one out of this. This is the uh, G, G lid, glid, I don't know, gellid, I don't know how you say it. But I'm gonna go ahead and cut one to fit. It feels like it might be too thick. Yeah, it's, well, definitely too thick, I believe. Let's just see how hard it is to pop the lid down. I might have to go to the two mil or even the one and a half. Well, it popped into place without any problem. So, looks like we're probably, that means that a one mil or one half mil probably isn't doing you much good at all. Okay. Place it right there. And it looks like we're, we wanna make sure we cover that entire controller chip. So let's start from this end. As I mentioned in other videos, the controller chip is the really sensitive part to heat. Um, and you'll notice there's a groove in the top and I think that's why it looks like it's sticking up but it's still not making contact because we're gonna fit in that groove. All right. Feels like we made good contact. Difficult to open, so I think we're good. Well, it's all installed. I actually switched to the four terabyte version of this SSD, the 850 Black from Western Digital, instead of the eight, because that's actually an empty one. And I always like to start these tests with a freshly formatted one. That helps us understand how the SLC cache might work as well. First, we're just gonna get a basic look at Blackmagic and the raw speed capability of it. This is connected directly to the Mac. And as you can see, we're getting almost 6,000 or megabytes a second a write and about 5,800 megabytes a second read. Let's jump ahead quite a ways and you'll notice that even after a couple of minutes, uh, speed hasn't changed and you'll notice the temperature is only 104 degrees. So this kind of random reading writing just really doesn't push these SSDs. It doesn't build up a lot of heat and whatever cooling. I do have the fan on right now just because I want to know the, the best case scenario. But the upper limit of this particular SSD is listed at 140 degrees and we're not even close to that. So now let's just see how well it handles a stress test. Most people aren't going to put these drives under any kind of a stress that will the temperatures are a concern. Basically, things like finder copies, even working with videos, it really doesn't push them much. But if we're doing a file copy of really large files, especially several of those together, such as 100 gigabyte, 80 to 90 gigabyte, just big files so that the overhead is much smaller, that's where we'll stress the drive out. And I assume if we're writing 8K or 12K data to the device, that's a field I'm not real familiar with. Certainly it handles 4K just fine but that might stress it. I really am not quite sure how that bandwidth works. So, uh, but I think this proves that we can really get a pretty good throughput of data. This is basically the 400 gigabyte file. It's got 300 gigabytes of data on it. We're gonna copy it twice. We'll see how long it takes. And this will give us an idea of what we're gonna really push uh, temperature. This is probably the most you'll ever see. So here we go, let's drop it in. And this real quick, we can get rid of black magic and uh, we can follow. You can see that it's copying pretty quickly. I've got uh, activity monitor up and that gives me an idea of the actual throughput. And of course here I'm monitoring the actual temperature of the controller chip on the drive. And we're moving pretty good. Let's just jump ahead real quick. And we're approaching the end. As you can see, this is still only 129 degrees. Let's just drop it in again real quick and copy it again just to see how well it does. You can tell that we're maintaining our six gigabytes or 6,000 megabytes a second speed without much trouble. Again, let's just jump ahead real quick. 
And as we get near the end, you'll see we're at 135 degrees. That's below the manufacturer's recommended speed. Obviously, it's only going to run at this hot of a temperature for a short period of time. So that's pretty stressful. I don't know if that's as stressful as you can get. Interestingly enough, we never saw a slowdown from the limit of that SLC cache, which I thought was only about 400 gigabytes. But obviously, we didn't slow down through 800 gigabytes. One of these days, I'm going to try to figure all that out and maybe do a video on it. They're a little strange how they work. And I have, can't find any real good documentation on how well they clear uh, do they are they clearing the cache as they're writing data? Once the SLC cache fills up on these devices, it's much, much slower. And you know, you drop down to below 2000 a second, and you really can't get past that again until you quit copying and let that SLC cache clear. Now, I assume it can clear fairly quickly, but that's something that's done internally, and I, I don't know about that. So, that might make you know, I'm researching it now, it might make an interesting video. Anyway, it looks like this is a great device. There's one last thing I want to test, though, and that's just, does it actually work as a Thunderbolt or as a USB 3 device? And let's just plug it into a USB 3 port and see what kind of speed we get. Okay, now we're hooked up to the USB port. That's USB 3.2 port on the CalDigit Thunderbolt 5 hub. And as you can see, we're getting about what we would expect from a Thunderbolt for or from a USB 3 device. We're getting about 900 read, 7 to 800 or 900 write, 7 to 800 read, not bad. Now, the other device, the 501, TV501, it will not operate. This was a feature they added to this one. I, it means, I think it means they had to actually put in a second controller. The tree bleed also doesn't work as a USB 4 to, or USB 3 device. So this is the only one I know so far which can handle either a USB 3 port, uh, 3.2 port most likely, or a Thunderbolt 3, 4, or 5 port. Well, that's a wrap. I think I've kind of given everything I can. If you have any questions, let me know below. Fan is very, very quiet. Very nice construction, how they make their devices. Simple to put together. Uh, well made. Very, very solid. I will put a link in the description below to both the 501, the 405, I think, which is a solid device if you only need USB 4. And of course, the new one, the 501 Pro. I will tell you that I do get a little bit of a commission if you buy one through my links. And if you've watched any of my videos, you know that if I review a product that I don't think is very good, you won't find a link in the description. Well, hope you enjoyed the video. Hope it was helpful. Make sure you like and subscribe. Hey, thanks for watching. See ya.